Hello, everyone. This is Mike Steckline, with the Institute for Enterprise Excellence. Hope everyone's enjoying a good day. I have a treat today. I'm broadcasting uh, this webinar from Fort Myers, Florida, with friends and colleagues at uh, Gulf Coast Medical Center, uh, part of Lee Health. Uh, today's presentation is going to feature uh, Lou Fries uh, on the topic of natural leadership. I find this very interesting. I hope that you will, too. And uh, I'm going to go through some introductory slides here, and then uh, we'll get right uh, to the presentation by Lou. Uh, first of all, the phones are going to be on mute so that we don't pick up background noise uh, from others. And uh, you can use the chat function on the webinar in order to um, put any questions out there that we'll talk about later. Uh, when we save some time toward the end, we will talk about um, opening up the phones for doing some Q&A. And this webinar is being recorded, so if you aren't able to participate uh, or if you want to share this with others, you'll get the link and the information you need in order to do that. So as I've been learning about this topic from Lou and from the folks here at uh, Lee Health, and we've been uh, kind of drawing pictures about how this connects with the model that we talk about, I've got some introductory slides to explain a little bit about how I'm viewing this, and I'm going to turn it over to Lou. One of the things we think about is there's uh, individuals and then there's systems. I can't talk to a system, but I can talk to a person. I can talk to an individual. We know that individuals do uh, and can create systems, and those are both formal and informal. Uh, we also know that the systems are going to influence individuals. They drive behaviors. Uh, it's not the only thing that drives behaviors, but they do drive behaviors. And also there's multiple systems going on at any time that are driving the behaviors of individuals. A working definition I like comes from Dr. Deming, a network of interdependent components working together to accomplish a common aim, a definition of what do we mean by a system. They can be formal and informal, as I said. It could be as simple as a routine, a common way that we do something. And usually those informal systems are going to tend to dominate the formal ones. Uh, that's because there's stronger local ownership and autonomy with those informal systems. Uh, now, something to think about on the individual side, and I'm going to build on this in another slide in a bit. Uh, individuals can form systems. Here's a simple four-person system working together. Uh, we know when we understand systems thinking, the output of a four-person system is more than just the sum of each person. It's the product of their interactions, and you want those interactions between the people to be positive. So I put the individual system circle here in the middle. And I think about, well, the typical lean program, um, what does it emphasize? And it seems that primarily there's an emphasis on these principles, which is not wrong. It's certainly something that people are trying to um, focus on process, quality at the source, and the, these principles. Um, but when we talk about the model that we use at IEX, we put our sustainability model square in the middle of the individual system because we think it's both individual and system. It's both performance outcomes and ideal behaviors. So it's both and, not either or. And when we think about the velocity model of, uh, that we're talking about at IEX, and you think about the guiding principles for enterprise excellence in those dimensions around align, enable, and improve, we can then connect and say, those are those guiding principles, and there are many guiding principles. These are the ones that we think are the most important ones for an organization to stay in business. Um, you can see how they line up with the velocity model. In the middle of that velocity model is the work systems. We're trying to align the work. We're trying to enable the people to work within the work systems and so that they can improve those work systems. But this velocity model also talks about what are the systems that you would see around the periphery of this model that are going to be built on those principles that you're going to see there. The latest iteration of the white paper that explains these two models you can find at that bit.ly link at the top. Now, when I think about what I've been learning about natural leadership, and Lou's going to be talking about this in way more detail, it's his area of expertise, I think about it's on that individual side primarily, and he's going to be mentioning um, attributes, practices, and habits. And today's presentation is just a beginning exploration of these topics, and I'm sure we'll be having future conversations down the road. In my mind, it seems that it's on a continuum. The right-hand side toward those uh, more traditional lean principles, the ones people usually associate with lean, tend to be primarily the ones that gravitate toward the engineering mindset, the hard skills, the processes, the flowcharts, 
those sorts of things. On the left side of the continuum, it seems to be primarily something that appeals to the organizational development mindset. Some call it the soft skills. I've heard Lou call it the inner work. And I think both are important. So here's some things I've been thinking about. The IEX model is driven by the understanding of these guiding principles that we talked about earlier, and the understanding of the relationships between results tools, systems, principles, and purpose to create a sustainable culture of continual improvement. It rests on a foundation and an environment of psychological safety. The consequence of not understanding or following these guiding principles is the survival of the company. Not understanding these principles will put you out of business. Some are going to be short term, some are going to be longer term, but they do have consequence. That's one of the definitions of a principle. I think about the individual diagram again, individual parts working together, they form the system. And again, the output is more than the sum of the parts. It depends on the product of those interactions. When I've been learning about the work that Lou and his wife Ann have been talking about, I think for me it boils down to this. Natural leadership seems to focus on the science and the art of the interactions and the relationships between people. And I just sum summarized it this way. This says, there's me on this circle, and there's any other on another circle. And a lot of it has to do with what's going on in those interactions. What's the quality of those interactions? So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to friend and colleague Lou Fries, who's going to share uh, more about this uh, important and intriguing topic. Thanks, Lou. Thanks, Mike. Um, today we're going to talk about how to tap the power of natural leadership. And um, we're really going to cover, in today's webinar, three major areas. First, what I'm going to do is talk about the difference between natural leadership and how it's different from formal leadership. They're both important to have within a company. And even the CEO can be a natural leader. The difference between a formal leader and a natural leader is the person scrubbing the floor also could be a natural leader. And the journey of natural leadership is the same for both of them. So we're going to talk about what makes it different. And then we're going to talk about how natural leadership drives motivation and influence and engagement. It, it is the source that drives up engagement scores. And then thirdly, we're going to talk about how it transforms and aligns the workplace culture to ensure, of course, success of lean process improvement. We're going to talk a lot about the science behind this, not just the concepts, but the science. What kind of research has been done on these very qualities and characteristics? So let's start out. I want to start out with a story that uh, illustrates that leadership is not about position, power, or control. So in the 1990s, there was an interchange between British authorities and a ship captain and it, off the shores of Great Britain, in the waters off Great Britain. It went like this. Uh, the Brits, please adjust your course 15 degrees south in order to enjoy, uh, avoid a collision. Americans, please adjust your course 15 degrees north in order to avoid a collision. Brits, negative. You'll have to adjust your course. I'm clicking here. <laughs> 15 degrees uh, south to avoid a collision. Americans, this is the captain. I say again, divert your course. Divert your course. Brits, negative. I say again, you'll have to divert your course. American captain says, this is the captain. I'm the captain of the second largest ship in the North Atlantic fleet. We have three destroyers, three battleships, and numerous support ships accompanying us in these waters. You must divert your course now, 13 degrees north, or we'll have to take protective action in order to keep 
make sure that you do not undermine these ships. I demand that you divert your course now. That's 15 degrees north now. Rit, this is the lighthouse. Your call. <laughs> now that kind of issue gets played out in subtle ways all the way through organizations. When somebody tries to exercise power and control and position in order to exercise leadership, it has the same kind of quality to it. So we're going to talk about what really does create leadership, both formal and informal, informal being natural leadership. And I want to share some uh, a study, which I showed you little pictures of quite a bit there, by mistake, <laughs> when I was talking through this. It turns out that in southern Italy, in Parma, there were a group of scientists who studied macaw monkeys. And they would wire them up so they could see how their brains, uh, uh, the neurons in their brains, uh, fired under various conditions. And uh, they did this for many years, and they discovered that uh, something strange was happening quite often. They never paid a lot of attention to it at first, but what was strange was that the neurons that control our muscles somehow were firing at times, even when the macaw monkey was sitting still. So they decided, let's, let's test this out. So they had the monkey sit in the chair, and they had it raise its arm, lower it, move it across its chest, move back, raise its arm, and lower it again. And then they had the monkey sit there while the researcher did the same thing. And they discovered an amazing thing. The monkey's brain fired exactly the same way it did when it was watching somebody else as it did when the monkey was doing that activity. And it was the neurons that control muscles that were firing that way. This led to an explosion of research. And Marco Iacomini wrote a whole book on mirroring people based on that research. It turns out that they, when they started to do it with uh, humans, they discovered that it was far more than just the muscles that were affected by another person. It was mood. It was uh, it was the degree of happiness. It was uh, whether they were toxic or not toxic. A whole range of qualities were being transmitted through mirroring. As a result of this, what they discovered is that many traits, moods, behaviors get transmitted through these neurons, through, through, through just watching and being around somebody. And then they started doing some other research. They said, well, that's because the monkey sees people and we see people. So they did a piece of research in which they put uh, three people in a room, one of whom they knew was happy, and the other two were neutral, and said, we don't want you, we don't want you to look at each other, we don't want you to uh, have any contact whatsoever, so just sit there and stare straight ahead for five minutes, which they did. The two people that went in that were neutral came out happier than when they went in. They picked up the mood of the person, the third person who was happy. They reversed it, and the same thing happened with unhappiness. So natural leadership is based on the fact that we influence people all the time based on who we are and what we're like. And that influence is, in fact, a source of leadership because it changes people's behavior. And the influence, there's a, there are other ways we influence people, but that influence uh, is a very powerful one. Now, why do we call it natural leadership? 
Because for some people, the kind of behavior that brings people forward is just natural. They've been doing it all of their lives. And they see they have uh, a series of attributes. And they carry those attributes with them all the time, no matter what they're doing or who they're with. So that's a form of leadership because it influences people. So natural influence, leaders influence people by the way they are, by their very presence. It requires an open heart, self-awareness, commitment to an appreciation of your own and others' humanity. Anyone, anywhere can do it. But this is the way most organizations look. At the right end of that bell-shaped curve are the people that, no matter who they're with, they exert those moves, those behaviors, and have that kind of influence. The overwhelming majority of the people in an organization we could call followers. And at the other end are negative influencers. So if the people that are called followers are around people who are negative influencers, they feel more negative. And they act that way. And you know what it's like when you have toxic people in your organization. You can see how it affects the people around them. You notice that the people in that bell-shaped curve who tend toward the negative influencer end have a lot of those qualities themselves. They're more easily influenced. The same is true for the people at the natural leader end. They carry natural leadership implicitly in their moves and so forth. And so they're more easily influenced by natural leaders. Interesting thing about this influence is that it influences everybody to three degrees of separation. The influence goes not just from me to the people that I'm with right now, but it goes from those people to the next round. And from those people, it will go to another round, which is not up there. <laughs> but nevertheless, it happens, three degrees. Now, this means that it affects everybody in the usual workplace. It means that the person that's working on the uh, changing bedpans in a hospital affects the patient. The person who's doing something that doesn't seem to have any impact on the patient is really with their mood and their natural leadership affecting the others. So leadership is not just about motivating people, however. It's about helping people motivate themselves. And the goal is to have that kind of a a diagram where the natural leaders are at the are at the right end and look at how that curve goes up. That's what you want in the workplace. You've got some followers, but most of the people are natural leaders. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what kind of leadership this really is. We're not just talking about influence. We're talking about something else. You've all read about uh, rats in in uh, going through mazes and how that gave rise uh, to stimulus response. The whole idea of stimulus response is if you put some cheese at the other end of that maze, the rat's going to go for it and he's going to find his way to it one way or another. And that orientation toward leadership has been there for a long time. A few years ago, they decided not to put anything at the other end of the maze and see what happened to those rats. And they discovered that the rat, once they put him in there, even though he'd never been in a maze before, his curiosity was taking him through the thing and he was having a good time. And he made it all the way through it, and in fact, made it through faster than the, the uh, rat that was being stimulated by cheese. And then he discovered a couple other things. That not only did that rat make it through faster, but he remembered longer. And he was more innovative and changed faster. In other words, he found those places that were dead ends and didn't use them the next time. The rat did it just for the enjoyment of doing it. Now, they've done some other research based on that. They've 
they've uh, done some studies of artists, and they've discovered something very interesting. They discovered that artists who are paid to do their art don't do as good an art as the ones who just do it for the satisfaction of doing it. And they, they compared the art, they collected art from both kinds of people and gave them to, to some critics who didn't know that that's the difference that they were looking for. Sure enough, the critics judged their art as far superior when the people were doing it from what was coming inside just for the pure enjoyment of it. I'm going to pick up on that for in a minute. Because what really what is it that really inspires their motivation, innovation, and engagement? Natural leaders inspire and influence others using three intrinsic motivators. And those motivators have been the, the reason, well, subject of tremendous amount of studies since the I would say mid 1980s, when a guy named DC is the one who really identified the difference among those motivators. The first motivator is the fulfillment of the essential self. It's being the best version of who you are. And DC called this autonomy. And by autonomy, he didn't mean just go do your own thing. What he meant was feeling your own uniqueness, experiencing that. The second motivator was authentic connection without boundaries. And once again, he took it further than that. What he was saying was, it's intrinsically motivating to us to want to be generous to other people. You know how you get a good feeling when you're, when you're generous to somebody. And TC is saying, that's an intrinsic motivator. He took it in third place. He said intrinsic motivators also are, are activated by improvement. In the middle of the 20th century, Yasha Heifetz, I don't know if you remember him or not, but he was one of the greatest violinists of the 20th century. He had just given a concert, and following the concert, <clears throat> one of the better critics of the world interviewed him and he said, uh, Mr. Heifetz, why is it, uh, how does it feel, is what he really asked him, how does it feel to be so good that other people can't even see your flaws, not even the best critics? And he said, almost surprised, I see him. And my biggest satisfaction is identifying them and improving. A similar thing happened with Vladimir Horowitz. He gave his last concert when he was 90. And I was lucky enough that I heard it on the radio, a replay of it, but it wasn't the actual concert. And it was, it had such wisdom in it that it just moved me as I was driving across uh, South Florida on what's called Alligator Alley. <laughs> Five years later, he was interviewed by a critic. Now he's 95. And the critic is sitting there talking about his life and so forth. And then he says, now I have a really important question to ask you, Mr. Hypus. You're 95 years old. You're never going to give another concert. Your last concert was five years ago. Why is it you keep practicing 20 hours a day? I mean, 10 hours a day, I'm sorry. 10 hours a day. <laughs> 20 hours, that'd be a lot. And he said, to get better. Number three on that list, improvement, learning, and growing, is why he practiced 10 hours a day. Don't we all know that money is a real motivator? That if we can just be rich enough, we'll be happy? In fact, they did some studies of very rich people people who were billionaires, and they asked them, uh, you know, how much money would you have to make in order to really be happy? And to a person, they said, triple what I'm making now. 
triple. Didn't matter how much they were making, it was triple. What they discovered is some interesting things about people who are driven extrinsically by making money. They discovered, for example, that when they show them a picture of a child with cancer, their empathic neurons don't fire. When they show a poor person the same picture, there's an explosion of neurons. Great empathy. They discovered that rich people tell more lies, uh, they cheat more, they violate the rules of the road, and get this, take candy from children and shoplift. A multi-billionaire picking something up in a store and putting it away. Now, not all very rich people do that. There are a lot of very rich people who set up funds to help people around the world. It's because for them, being rich doesn't matter most. It's their self-expression that matters most. But being rich does matter most. It doesn't motivate you as a natural leader at all. It dampens the very things you want. Now, Henry Kurtzberg uh, did a lot of studies of this in the early late 60s into the 70s, and he wrote a paper, uh, wrote a book about it, but the paper he wrote, um, article for Harvard Business Review, turned out to be the most requested uh, article in its history, and still is. It's titled, One More Time, How Do You Motivate People? What he, the case he makes is very simple. Yes, money motivates us to step up until we have enough, until we think what we're doing is worth what we're being paid. If you pay somebody more than that, it doesn't increase their engagement at all. It's not a motivator. They like it, it's pleasurable, but it doesn't motivate them. So intrinsic motivators are what natural leadership is all about. And the intrinsic motivators are the key to engagement and buy-in. Now I want to talk for a second about engagement. The Gallup organization has been doing studies of engagement for 20 years. One of the themes they found in those studies of engagement is that something like 350 billion to $450 billion a year are wasted because of low engagement in the Fortune 100 companies of this country. Think about that. It's hidden money. Nobody even knows that it isn't there. It's all because people are engaged. They're motivated extrinsically. So leadership needs to take a new form. From the top, moving from top down prescriptive leadership to connecting people to their own intrinsic motivators. And to do this, one of the qualities of it is that leadership begins to operate from pull rather than push. And pull is the attraction that is set into motion in response to anything that's significant or important to us. And it's given attention. When what's significant is our essential self, it becomes an intrinsic motivator. So, the interesting thing about all this is that the knowledge about intrinsic motivators we've had through the millennia. A guy by the name of Lao Tzu lived 2,500 years ago. He said those four things. Now think about that as lean. That's what you're doing in the workplace. Lao Tzu said, that's what you should do. He said, learn from the people. Plan with the people. Begin with what they have. Build on what they know. That's what's beautiful about the lean processes that you're involved in. That's 
the essence of what natural leadership is about. Bringing that inside of the person. And then he said one other thing that's been a shocker for three millennia. Of the best leaders, when their task is accomplished, the people say, we've done it ourselves. They own it. And so they celebrate it. So, let's talk about natural leadership. Mike showed you uh, this uh, slide. In the middle, our habits. In the next concentric circle, our practices. And then in the outside circle, our attributes. I'm going to pick up on the habits and practices in a deeper way in future webinars, but let me just say a little bit about them right now. What are the habits? People live deliberately, and what does that mean? That means they're aware of the here and now and what's going on inside themselves and the degree to which they're feeling intrinsically motivated right now, day by day. They're aware of the observer they are, and what does that mean? It means that they're aware of the fact that we see the world as we are, not as it is. And when they see the world in twisted ways, they step back and ask, what am I saying inside of my own head that causes me to see the world that way? They know they're their mirror. They understand that people pick up on their attitudes, their beliefs, their desires. They pivot when they see themselves going down the wrong direction in terms of these other habits. And right at the core is their desire to consistently recognize and fulfill their essential self. Now, six best practices have to do with ways you can get better at that, the way you think using pull, building high-quality social networks that move out into the organization rather than being a tight little group, and using the three degrees of separation to move it out. This is why we call it change from the inside out. It's not just inside ourselves. It's within an organization moving out in all directions. They invest in social capital. And social capital is... Uh, uh, investment in trust and well-being that comes back to greet you in the future. It is capital, just like investment in a bank, of, of good feelings toward each other, good behaviors toward each other, knowing that that person is all right. They engage in inspired conversations, of course, and create engagement processes that flow. Those are the practices, and we're going to pick them up and deepen them uh, more in the future. The five attributes make the right things matter most. To me, that's one of the most critical ones, and I mentioned that when we were talking about money. The wrong things are anything that is intrinsically motivated. So position, power, influence that I started out with, the wrong things. They might be nice to have, but if they matter most, they take us the wrong direction. There are so many things. Our, our, our status, uh, whether other people like us or not, uh, whether we're uh, respected, all of those things aren't what matters most. What matters most is those three intrinsic motivators within ourselves. And what matters most for an organization is its mission. It's the people that it serves and the people that make it serve that way. That's what matters most. And when money becomes the thing that matters most for an organization, it has the same influence as it does on individuals. First thing people do when they look at, the, at something that's going to be initiated is, initiated is 
Well, how much is that going to cost? Wrong things. That's the wrong question. The question is, what will that do for this organization? Will it engage people? Will it make our services better? Ultimately, if you're a hospital, will it make the flow of patient experience better? That's what matters most. So that's the first one. And a natural leader asks that question every day. Am I making the right things matter most? The second attribute is making authentic connections without boundaries. We talked about that before. The word boundaries is a really important one. I think there was a very smart guy some years ago who talked about uh, no barriers, break down barriers. Hmm. He should be somebody that started uh, started a process improvement cycle. Maybe he could have helped the, the Japanese because they didn't seem to pay much attention to him at first. But Ed Demick went over there and he taught them a lot of things. And he talked about boundaries, and he saw that as the enemy of good work within an organization. Not silos, not levels, no boundaries. Natural leadership flows in all directions, right through those boundaries. A nurse, uh, one time when we were running a natural leadership uh, experience, we asked, what's the most important thing you learned today at the end of the session? And this was a session that had multiple levels of administrative people in it, as well as not only nurses, but physicians and uh, people who were right there in the Gemba doing the work day to day. She said, the most important thing I learned today is we're all on the same level. We're all on the same level because this is the work we're doing. And there they were helping each other with that work. It didn't matter, doesn't matter whether you're a CEO or the person changing bedpans. Natural leadership, that journey, is everyone on the same level. The third one is happy, open-hearted attitudes. And it's interesting. Joseph Campbell uh, during his later years, gave many, many speeches to college students. And his biggest advice for them was, follow your bliss. And when I heard that word bliss, I thought, oh, man, is that a bunch of frou-frou. Uh, <clears throat> until I cut back into it to a deeper level. And what he was really telling people is, there's a sense of good feeling, of well-being that you get when you're on your own track, on the right track, and you'll know whether you're on it or not, depending on how you feel. And we're going to review some studies of that so-called bliss, that happiness, in just a moment. The other two are triggering best instincts and trust emergence, and we're going to visit that one in a moment, too. But what we're talking about here is transformation. And uh, not the fairy tale transformation that you see up there, <laughs> where a frog becomes a, a prince. Natural leadership transforms and aligns the workplace culture to ensure success of lean process improvement. That's what it does. And it is true transformation. And I wanted to tell you, I want to quickly share some research that's been done on this. That mood, that happy mood, that positive mood is not just about pleasure. Nothing wrong with pleasure. But this is a deeper kind of positivity. And this research shows that that mood widens the scope of attention that we're able to give in any moment. One of the discoveries they have had with physicians, for example, when they're in that kind of a positive mood is they see a wider bandwidth of information. And uh, it helps to make sure that they aren't just seeing this patient with a circumscribed set of issues, but they can very quickly diagnose, that they see the other subtle things 
that are going on that might make for a very different diagnosis. It increases the degree to which people perform discretionary acts for the benefit of an organization. And of course, that's what engagement is all about. They just do it. They do it because we, it, a natural leader is intrinsically motivated to be generous and to give. And that is, there's a reward in that. It's, I've often said to people when I'm coaching them, yeah, be selfish, give. <laughs> And notice how it makes you feel. It increases intuition and creativity. Again, there's all kinds of research that shows that. That positive attitude that comes from the intrinsic motivators causes people to think through things in new ways in the workplace. It heightens a group's ability. Now we're talking about a group to deal with complex ideas and formulate out-of-the-box solutions. It shifts teams into great creative elaboration and exploration of ideas rather than just dead-ending ideas. It creates better, more behavioral variability within moment-to-moment -moment interactions across organizational members. And look at that one. It creates organizational resilience in times of threat. Think of organizations and wonder, you wonder, hmm, they're feeling times of threat. That positive mood scientifically has been shown to create more resilience, the ability to get back up and use the threat to leverage it for something more creative and more powerful and more effective. So, Holly, I'm going to invite you to join in here because we're going to talk about Align, enable, and improve. And you've had a lot of experience working with that. I've heard you and Evan uh, talking about the way I'm um, sitting in a room in which you just laid out ways to look at the KPIs and the KBIs of align, enable, and improve. So Holly, would you uh, pick up here and talk a little bit about it? And you can click forward as you wish. Thank you, Lou. It's my pleasure to, to join you in this. This is really important work. and. Um, you know, for me, um, I hope to provide a practical example about how natural leadership can be used within acute care hospital setting in order to drive that operational excellence and to get the key performance indicators that you're looking at. But more importantly, back to Mike's point at the beginning when we talked about the IEX model and the hard and the soft skills, to really um, to find the um, that where the success can be in the key behavioral indicators. Because just as Mike said earlier in, in the model, you it, it's all of that coming together in order to really drive the operational excellence. And that was important to me. You know, as a hospital operator, you know, I'm looking at our regulatory and quality um, standards that we need to follow. I'm looking at the local improvement work that's going on within quality councils and, of course, embracing the lean transformation principles, which I like to say is I'm putting process improvement on steroids. But that methodology really provides the discipline and the thought process to help your improvement and your ideas actually become a reality and, and helps you to, to have that methodology to support that. But more importantly, there's the human side of it. And a lot of times if you fall short in meeting your metrics, you have to examine why, and you need to look at the culture and where your team is at in regards to their um, their leadership behaviors and competencies. So I was really excited to learn more about natural leadership and to have an opportunity to expose our interdisciplinary leadership team to those principles um, so that they could um, do that self-examination individually, but also how do they interconnect with each other as a group and then once again, how does that position them or not to be successful in leading the hospital? Because you know the, the patients are our 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 main mission, um, and we need to make sure this is really important work. We're not working with widgets; we're working with people, and it's important to take a look at that. So for me, I was really searching for a way to pull all of those elements together into one model. So I think the work that we're talking about today. Um, you know, the conceptual framework, the velocity model, and the natural leadership um, gives us a platform to be able to really do that well and to have some intentional conversations to um, determine how we're doing with that. 
Um, we did have an opportunity to put our leaders, as I said, through the Natural Leadership Program. And just to, just to provide some practical stories, um, I really saw a transformation in how a team that was already good really took steps towards being great and how they functioned as an interdisciplinary team. Because you have to have that interconnectivity between people and systems, which we've talked about, in order to get your best results. Um, so immediately I, I saw the shift in their mindset. I saw them um, becoming more um, focused in how they thought about their individual actions um, as people and as leaders, and, and how that affected and impacted the systems that they were working on. Um, and, and once again, I think um, what it, so after everyone has gone through natural leadership, and then you think about the velocity model, and you think about the align, enable, improve, right? First, when you think about um, alignment, and I'll just move forward to that slide for the purpose of doing that. Oh, there's some transitions here. Let's make those happen. There we go. So when you think about a line, the practical example that I want to provide is think about your organizational mission, vision, and values. Okay? These are not just documents and words on paper. They should explain the way, not just the work that you're going to do, but the spirit and the work for which and how you're going to do it. And I think natural leadership, once again, provides that mindset so that when you think about um, the mission, vision, and values, it, it causes you to internally examine how you live and breathe that each day. So if you're successful with, with that, you should be able to not just say what those are, but really deeply explain how that connects your work and for anyone that um, you're working with um, um, within, within that setting. Um, the, the other thing that I've seen, seen um, natural leadership do in connection with um, the, the alignment is to, as leaders are rounding and they're doing their work, it causes them to uh, be better observers. It causes them to think more systemically about what they are observing um, out in their workplace and to um, not only observe but ask questions in a way that really provides a deeper understanding of the work that's being done. Um, as I've seen this unfold, I've, I've seen the leaders learn more about their day-to-day -day operations and learn more about their people. And then by being better informed, um, then the process improvement work and all of these other things that we're doing are more successful because we deep, more deeply understand the root cause and what's driving people. So when we look at it with the natural leadership and just being you know, aware of the observer that you are and understanding yourself, I mean, all of these habits, practices, and attributes um, provide um, a deeper level of thought process about how you show up as a leader and how you drive those outcomes. Um, with, with the enable, I like to think of these as um, the tools um, that help you to do your process improvement work. Um, but, you know, looking at the natural leadership concepts here, um, you know, multi-directional mutual support, you know, in this journey, I think this goes back to the interdisciplinary team and, um, and the awareness that um, you need to not think in silos, you need to, to think across um, the systems um, that you interface with. Um, and you've mentioned here um, the poll strategies. I think the important thing to learn about this journey is um, you need to meet people where they are in their development. You need to meet them where they are and, um, and allow this to emerge um, you know, over, over time. And lastly, with the improve, um, you talked about the science, you know, the art and science of this. Mike mentioned this as well. I and mean, I definitely think there is leadership science behind this. And so how does, how does natural leadership become that precursor um, so you can develop the appropriate mindset with your leaders? And then when you look at the key behavioral indicators, the principles um, for which you lead, um, that all pulls that together in the model. Um, and you have comments here, you know, definitely the, the mirroring, um, whatever we do as leaders, we're trying to um, mirror, you know, have our staff mirror that as well. And um, that helps facilitate a lot of the learning as we go forward too. 
And I believe that goes back to you, Liv. Okay. I want to uh, tap on the whole idea of emergence <clears throat> because uh, emergence is a, a, a concept that was developed out of the biological sciences as they watch birds flock and um, they watch bees and ants and then they watched ants working with bees. <laughs> And uh, you'll see them at, at their work. There they go. And notice how they're working together. Notice even when one of them finds that he's not needed or it's not needed, it tr tries certain areas and then says, oh, I'm going to go help someplace else. There he goes. <laughs> the thing about emergence is, is that in human <clears throat> systems, there isn't any queen bee. They used to believe that uh, the queen bee uh, actually uh, did all kinds of uh, running of the hive, and they discovered that the queen bee, actually even in bee systems, simply lays eggs. There is no, the, the emergence that happens in those systems flows because of common values, because of intrinsic motivation, because of engagement, and there's an interconnection among them. That interconnection is a, is a subliminal sense of awareness of what my place is in this and what I can do about it. And if you watch flocking birds, you'll see that, that sense of oneness that happens with, a, with that flock of birds. And every single one of them, there's no bird standing at the side with a flip chart saying, okay, no, wait a minute, let's, let's go this way or that way. They're all engaged. You don't see an ant saying, oh, well, that looks like it's pretty good, going pretty good. I think I'll, you know, I'll just uh, step aside here for a little bit and take a rest and check out, or I'll do what I have to do. The engagement is 100% for every one of those emergent animal systems. Whether it's a school of fish, or a flock of geese, uh, or a whole herd of buffalo. <laughs> They're all engaged. And so emergence, my experience is that you get that intuitively. You see serendipitous things happening in an emergent system. And you wonder, where'd that come from? But somebody else isn't surprised that it came from there because they're closer to whatever that serendipity was. You notice a connection among people who are similarly intrinsically motivated, moving together. A lot of what that movement, that connection is under the surface of awareness. It was Carl Jung who talked about the field and how we're connected underneath. Um, and there's no question for which. When you start moving together, as Holly was describing, where people are really getting it, that there's another thing going on. And that other thing is a sense of connection across the system. It's a system level thing that everybody who is intrinsically motivated and engaged feels. They have a hard time seeing it, but they feel it. So just to review, it's guided by natural leadership attributes. Its motivation is intrinsic. Its engagement is very high. And by the way, if you want to drive up engagement, this is the track to take. Improvement is continuous. It operates both above and below the level of conscious awareness. It has boundaryless connections among people. It doesn't matter whether it's a CEO or the person changing the bedpan. They're connected and serendipity is continuous. And it operates in flow. And in another webinar, I'll talk a little bit more about what that flow is like. Because a guy by the name of Mihai Chiksen Mihai really invented that word and did a superb amount of research in ORs, by the way. So, culture of natural leadership inspires system wide alignment. 
connects people to their own intrinsic motivators, fulfillment, improvement, and authentic connection with no boundaries. It expands the five attributes in all directions from the inside out as high engagement becomes emergent throughout the system. Now take a moment right now and remember a time in your life, and it might have been very recently, that it was especially satisfying and fulfilling. Notice how you felt. Notice that there was a different kind of good feeling than just going out and doing something pleasurable. Notice what it, it caused you to do. Notice the connection you had with other people while you were doing it. That experience can be created in the workplace. The whole workplace can be operated out of that sense of satisfaction and fulfillment. And that's the object of natural leadership. Thanks a million. I've enjoyed being with you today. Thanks, Lou. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, I'm unmuting the phones. We've got a few minutes here if anybody has any questions for the presenters today. It's a fascinating topic to me, and um, hopefully you found some benefit from it as well. So the phones are unmuted if anybody wants to ask any questions. The silent, courteous group. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some slides to talk about some next steps. And Liz mentioned that uh, there's more to talk about here than what we can cover in a short time. I would say that if you have a chance to chat with or visit the folks at um, Lee Health and as they're learning this, it's been a great opportunity for me to learn about what they've been doing. I'm sure they would um, love to tell you more about uh, their journey. So what's going to happen next is a recording from this uh, webinar is going to show up on our website. As you can see here, it will be moved over to the recordings. And what happens next, a uh, week of friend and colleague, uh, Christian Widener, is going to talk about um, uh, his view on lean as a system, uh, mindsets, management methods, and um, management system. Uh, the URLs there will uh, give you more information about what he's going to talk about. It includes a short video on the bottom URL. On August 18th, uh, we have part two of a presentation on the Pracademics Guide to Strategy of uh, Deployment. Jeff Hunter is going to co-present with me on some of the thinking that we have been doing on this. And we had a presentation in May that we didn't get through all the topics, so we're going to be talking about more of that in August. And uh, the URLs at the bottom will give you more information about that. And as I said, including a short video of that bottom uh, URL. In September, uh, Laura Brown from uh, uh, Memorial Health Care Health System in Fountain Valley, California, is going to talk about leader standard work. And you can learn more information about that at that uh, link below. Um, just so you know, the latest white paper that we wrote, um, we call it side-by-side -side management. Um, it's about doing things together, building on, I think, some of the things that I learned here from Lou and others. And uh, you can find the uh, information about that latest white paper. Appreciate your input on that. In doing that updated white paper, it um, was important to update all of our white papers to make sure all the links were there and also uh, these white papers are a work in process, so when we see more information and we learn more, we will uh, update the white papers so you can get that at that link on our website. And if you have any stories you'd like to share about your own improvement journey and how you're trying to create a culture of continual improvement, please contact me. We'd like to uh, feature you in a webinar. Uh, it's easy to do, pain to do. Uh, everyone benefits, everyone learns, and um, hopefully you've benefited from today's webinar. Uh, this recording will be available uh, for those on the call as well as those that couldn't make the call. So I uh, hope you have a good day, and uh, if you're traveling, travel safe. Thanks again for your time, and thanks again for the presenters today.